In this example, we're going to look at a quantum mechanical mass on a spring. So we first want to remind ourselves what we mean by mass on a spring and some of the stuff that we learned about in uh, Physics 1 about a mass on a spring. So imagine that you've got a, uh, a wall and a frictionless surface, and you've got a mass that's connected to a spring, and the spring is connected to the wall. So this isn't really, you're not going to have this happening actually quantum mechanically, but let's just remind ourselves classically what's going on here. So the spring has a spring constant k, the mass has a mass m, there is some uh, equilibrium position that we can uh, say that if the mass is at that position, the spring is neither compressed nor stretched, and, uh, and but if we do stretch the spring and we release it, it'll vibrate back and forth. So the mass will go back and forth with uh, kinetic energy, potential energy exchanging between the two, the velocity will be continuously changing, the position is continuously changing, um, and the amplitude that it has is going to depend on how much we stretch it in the first place. So the more we stretch it, the bigger it, it will move back and forth, and the bigger the velocity it'll have as it goes through the origin. So if we remember a couple things about this from Physics 1, um, we talked about the frequency of oscillation, omega. Um, this is actually more like an angular frequency. This is, this is 2 pi times a linear frequency, and that linear frequency f is is like the number of cycles per second, the number of vibrations per second. But that is equal to the square root of k divided by m. And k is the spring constant. k is not, this, this k is not a, like a 2 pi over lambda k. This is the spring constant k. So some kind of a stiffness constant. And the mass is the mass, the mass of the particle. So what was our energy? What kind of energy did we talk about this system having? Well, it has kinetic energy and it has potential energy. So the total energy, E, is uh, kinetic, so 1 half mass times velocity squared, uh, plus there's potential energy. And for the spring, that is 1 half K uh, X squared, the, the displacement. And so whatever the displacement is, at any moment in time, there's a certain potential energy stored in the spring, and that energy can be turned back into kinetic and back and forth. So the, the energy will assume is constant because there's no friction, no air resistance. So mechanical energy is constant, but it gets continually changed back and forth between kinetic and potential. Now, classically, classically we can have this en energy to be anything. Um, let's write it in one other way, though, first. Let's write it in terms of momentum, and, uh, and then we'll change this k to be in terms of the frequency, omega. So, so this is 1 half mass times velocity squared. That's the same as saying uh, momentum squared divided by 2m. And then the kinetic energy, or the potential energy, we're going to write as k, solve for k. k is, the, is omega squared times mass, bring the mass over. So we can write this as 1 half uh, mass omega squared times x squared. So we're just writing this in terms of the frequency rather than in terms of the stiffness constant. Because quantum mechanically, there isn't really a spring. But there is a frequency, so we do we can talk about subatomic particles, electrons, things like that, vibrating with certain frequencies. So they are somehow bound to something because of electromagnetic forces, not because of actual springs. But they do have a frequency, and they do vibrate very much like masses on springs, very much like simple harmonic motion. So it's better to write this in terms of frequency than it is a spring constant, because it really isn't a spring constant. Um, so this is our, our energy, kinetic plus potential. And classically, this can be anything. Uh, classically, this energy can be even be zero. We could have the particle just sitting there. We could put it at x equals zero, and then just let it go. And if we put it at x equals zero and let it go, there's no force on the mass. The, the potential energy is zero, and there's no force on it, on the mass, pushing it one way or the other. So it'll just stay there. Classically, the velocity would be zero. So the energy could be zero. Um, so classically, those, that's what could happen. Uh, but quantum mechanically, we have, we have a problem because of the uncertainty principle. So in quantum, we, can't say, we, can, we cannot say that both the momentum and the position are definitely zero. We, we can't know that. We can't say that. There, there is uncertainty. And so you know, we can make momentum measurements, and we can average those momentum measurements together. And we're going to get a number that's close to zero if we do that. 
if we if we could somehow measure the momentum without disturbing the system, which we can't. So what we really typically do in the laboratory when we do quantum mechanical experiments is we have an ensemble of identical systems, meaning we have thousands of identical vibrating masses on springs, and we make one measurement on each one. Because once we make a measurement, we actually interfere with the system. And we change it. We, we add energy to it. We take away energy. So, so we're just going to make one measurement on each mass on a spring. Sometimes we'll find a mass moving to the right, to the left, sometimes to the right. And so when we average those numbers together for momentum, because momentum can be positive and negative, we're going to get a number close to zero. But there's still going to be a spread in our numbers, in our data. Our numbers aren't all actually zero. There is some kind of a spread. And that's the uncertainty, delta P. In a similar way, we're going to find um, positions to be sometimes on the right and sometimes on the left of zero, the equilibrium. So sometimes they're going to be positive, sometimes negative. And, but the average of those will be zero uh, if we take enough measurements. But there's going to be a spread of the data, and the spread of that data is the uncertainty. So in this kind of a situation, uh, we've mentioned this before, when, you're, when your average value of a quantity is around zero, then the actual measured values, the actual values that you're measuring that average to be zero, those actual values are actually kind of roughly close to the uncertainty itself. The uncertainty gives you a spread of the data, and those, the data is spread around zero, and so those values that you actually measure are similar in magnitude to the uncertainty. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to find, um, we're going to approximate a lowest energy that this quantum mechanical mass on a spring can have. Uh, classically, the lowest energy can be zero, but quantum mechanically, with the uncertainty principle restricting the size of these uncertainties, and therefore restricting the size of the momentum and the position themselves, we're going to find that the minimum energy is not zero. The minimum energy is some bigger number. Maybe it's small, but it's still not zero. Right? So let's remind ourselves what that uncertainty principle is. It's uh, delta x times delta p is greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this and say, um, we're going to substitute into this energy expression. Instead of, del instead of the momentum, we're going to substitute the uncertainty and momentum. Because really, the momentum values, as we said, the measurements that you actually make, because they average to be zero, the actual measurements you make are roughly the same as the uncertainty. And so we're just going to plug in delta P for P and delta X for X to get our first sort of approximate equation for the energy of this system. And so this is going to be delta P squared divided by 2M and then um, plus 1 half mass omega squared delta X squared. Right. And then what we're going to say is we're going to say that, well, uh, this delta P is going to be solved for it here, it's going to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2 delta x. So delta p is going to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2 delta x. So what we're trying to do is we're ultimately trying to find a minimum for this energy. So let's use the minimum for the uncertainty and the momentum. And so that would be setting an equal sign here. And so instead of this delta, this delta P, we're going to plug in this, h bar over 2 delta x. So E minimum, whoops, go back, that little, go back. <laughs> this thing is acting funny in me here. Hold on a second. My little writing tablet is uh, not letting me write over there. Okay, so E minimum is going to be equal to or approximate. Again, this is all we're, all, we're approximating things, and we're going to do this more accurately uh, in the next chapter when we actually solve the Schrodinger equation. But instead of um, delta P being sort of whatever we want it to be, we're going we're gonna to write it in terms of delta X using an equality here. So we're looking at delta P minimum. So that's going to give us energy minimum. And so that's going to be 1 over 2M times uh, H bar over 2 delta x, and then we have to square that. And then we still have the 1 half 
mass omega squared delta x squared. So that's our energy, minimum energy, because we're plugging in a minimum for the momentum. But let's multiply this out a little bit. And how do we, how do we solve this? Let's just multiply this out. And then we'll kind of look at it at this. We'll kind of look at a plot of this thing. Um, so we've got h bar squared over uh, 2 squared. There's a 2 squared there on the bottom, and there's another 2. So there's an 8m. Oops, m, that's a weird m. And then I'll just write 1 over delta x squared. And then I have this stuff here, the same thing. 1 half m omega squared delta x squared. So what is this? What does this look like? So we've written the energy, the lowest energy in terms of delta x, the uncertainty in position. So what do we do with that? Well, let's just uh, just kind of plot this thing. Let's just think about what this might look like if we plotted it in terms of delta x. Delta x is the uncertainty in position. So we could imagine if we if we knew that the particle was traveling very uh, uh, with very small amplitude, vibrating back and forth with very small amplitude, um, then delta x would be very small, and this term would be large, while this term is small. If if we know it's vibrating with large amplitude, then this term would be large. This term would be small. So what does this function actually look like? Is it? It's certainly not a constant. It depends on sort of how much we know about how far away from equilibrium the particle is getting. So let's look at a graph of that thing, and we're just gonna we're just gonna write um, this h bar over eight m as just the number one, and then this stuff is just one. We just want to see the behavior of this. What is it? What kind of a graph does that look like? And so this is what it looks like. I just plotted one over x squared plus x squared, and I plotted from zero to three, and uh, so you can see the whole thing. So notice this this e thing we're calling e minimum actually has a minimum itself. And so there's a particular delta x value that makes this a minimum. And so let's figure out what that is. In other words, if I, if I think about a vibrating mass on a spring having a very small amplitude of vibration, that would be a very small delta x. That would mean that the, if I have a very small delta x, that means the uncertainty momentum is large. That means the momentum itself is large. That means there's a lot more kinetic energy than there is maybe potential. And so the energy, the total energy is high. If I have a very large delta x, then that means the momentum can be very small. So the kinetic energy can be very small, but this term can be very big. And so depending on kind of which way you're going, you can either have a very large delta x and therefore have large potential energy and the total energy is large, or you can have small delta x, but that means the momentum is big. And so, but again, the energy is big. So there's a minimum in there. Uh, this minimum energy equation has a minimum that doesn't go to zero, as we'll see. But let's find that minimum. What delta x value makes that a minimum? And so let's just do this the way we would do any kind of calculus thing. We take a derivative of this energy expression, the E energy minimum. And I'm just going to leave off the minimum subscripts. Um, we want to take this derivative with respect to delta x <clears throat> and then set it equal to zero. So this first term is delta x to the minus 2 power. So I'm going to take a derivative. I'm going to get a minus 2 is going to come down. So this thing's going to become negative. I'll have h bar squared over a minus 2 came down. So this is going to be a 4 times mass. And then I'll have 1 over delta x cubed. The minus 2 turns into a minus 3. And then this term, I take a derivative of this term with respect to delta x. I just get 2 delta x. The 2 cancels out that half. So I just have m omega squared delta x. And now we want to set that equal to 0. So setting that equal to 0 then allows us to solve for delta x. So just rearranging terms, if we bring the, the m omega squared delta x over to the other side, it becomes negative. But then there's already a negative here. And so we can write that um, we have the h bar squared over 4m, uh, 1 over delta x cubed. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring that, I'm going to multiply through by delta x cubed. So this will become a delta x to the fourth. That's what's going to come on the other side. 
And then, so I've got the h bar squared over 4m still over on the left, multiplying through by delta x cubed and putting that on the other side, the negatives cancel. But then I also have this m omega squared that went to the other side. We'll divide by that. So here I'll have an m squared omega squared. So that'll be delta x to the fourth power. Now I just take a square root. And so delta x squared, you could do delta x, you could take a fourth root, but let's just say delta x squared, the, the minimum of this energy function is, is where delta x squared is equal to h bar over uh, 2m omega. So that will give us a minimum energy, that will give us an absolute minimum energy of this vibrating mass on a spring. So now let's plug that back up into here for the energy minimum expression. So we already said that it was minimum because we were putting in a minimum of the potential or the uh, momentum. But so this is like a minimum of the minimum in a sense. We've minimized the minimum sort of. And so let's plug that in up here. So energy minimum, and, and we'll clearly see that it isn't zero. Things aren't gonna cancel out. Both terms are positive and neither is zero. So we have uh, h bar squared over 8m times 1 over delta x squared. So 2m omega over h bar. And then we have, so we're looking at this right here. And then we have this term here. 1 half m omega squared delta x squared. Delta x squared is h bar over 2m omega. And so we simplify some stuff. The, uh, the, eight, the h bar squared, uh, can, one of those h bars cancels out down here. The mass cancels out there. So we're left with an omega and a single h bar and then a 4 on the bottom. All right, so we have, we have 1 fourth. Um, we have one fourth. Is that right? Yeah, h bar omega. Okay. And then we have, in this term here, then we have a one half. Uh, there's another. There's a two there. So we have another. We have another four there on the bottom. We have an m that cancels out this m. Uh, we have one of these omegas cancel out. So we have an h bar with one omega, and we have again another another one-fourth. And so the total is that we have is one-half h bar omega. So that's our minimum. That's our minimum energy. In terms of the frequency, the minimum energy is not zero. Uh, the minimum energy is something. And we'll actually find that this is correct. This is, is exactly the correct answer when we actually solve this uh, quantum mechanically. Uh, using solving the Schrodinger equation. All right, so just to quickly review, we took a classical equation, classical expression for energy for a classical system, and we sort of quantized it by applying the uncertainty principle. And we did it by realizing that in this case, uh, the average values of the things that we measure are, are going to be zero. If we measure enough of them, those averages are going to be zero because of the symmetry of this problem. And so the actual measurements that we made are going to be similar to the uncertainties. And so we, we substituted in the uncertainty of one with the uncertainty of the other using this expression for the, for the minimum uncertainty in one of them in terms of the uncertainty in the other. And we got the energy expression in terms of one of those uncertainties. We could have done it the other way. We could have solved for delta x and then wrote this in terms of delta p. We would have gotten ultimately the same answer in the end to find the minimum of the energy. So this shows that a bound system, another example of a bound system, where the energy, the minimum energy can't be zero. There is some non-zero uh, minimum energy. And we'll, again, we'll find the same answer when we actually do this uh, correctly, quantum mechanically solving the Schrodinger equation.